My formal role is to welcome you all here on behalf of the College of Criminal Justice, our students, our faculty, the associate deans, and dean, and also to introduce today's veto chair lecturer, Dr. Austin Serrett. I'm going to stop for a moment. Most of you have heard me talking about Austin Surratt, and I learned quickly that it's Serrett yesterday. <coughs> I came from Maryland, and I, I, I went to junior high school in Surrattsville High School, which was named after the Surratts who, who hid James Wilkes Booth after having um, assassinated Lincoln, and so Surratt, Surratt. But anyway, Austin Serrett, and I apologize for all of the mispronunciations of your name that I've Maybe I should get out of Texas for a <laughs> Uh, Dr. Serrett is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Jurisprudence and Political Science at Amherst College. For those of you in Texas, Amherst is in Massachusetts, uh, one of the northern states. This is the fourth and final Beto Chair Lecture being presented this academic year. And in case you're not aware of it, all of the former lectures that have been held, most all of them this year, most of them from previous years, are available for viewing online. Um, videos of the lectures are available, and Austin's lecture will also become available sometime within the next couple of weeks. Just go to the College of Criminal Justice's homepage and find the Vito Chair Lecture Series, and you can download those into your iPods, and you can do whatever it is people do with things online uh, this year. Um, the Beto Chair Lecture Series actually originated in 1981, when the university received an endowment from the Jesse H. Jones and Mary Gibbs Jones Endowment Corporation, also known as the Houston Endowment. The purpose of the gift was to help enrich the educational experiences of the College of Criminal Justice's doctoral students by bringing leading figures in our discipline to campus. It was named in honor of Dr. George J. Beto, former director of the Texas Department of Corrections and a distinguished professor of, co of criminal justice here at San Houston State University from 1972 until 1992 when he retired. We have had the privilege of bringing a number of different scholars to the Criminal Justice Center as a result of this series, including scholars such as Leslie Wilkins, Rita Simon, Normal For Norval Morris, and Simon Dennis. And, among others, and we are proud to be able to uh, add Austin Serrett to this list of distinguished scholars who will have visited us. Dr. Serrett received his undergraduate degree from Providence College in Rhode Island. He then went on and earned his master's and PhD degrees, PhD degrees in political science from the University of Wisconsin. Fifteen years later, he went to Yale and completed his Juris Doctorate. He is the exception to the rule. I often tell people, if you're a JD, PhD, and you have earned your PhD first and then go on for your JD, it's a great mistake. But if you've got a JD and try to get your PhD, it shows that you're thinking. Austin has clarified that for me, and I realize that sometimes, sometimes I'm wrong about those kind of things. Immediately after receiving his PhD, Austin joined the faculty at Amherst College and has fundamentally worked there for the rest of his career in interrupting his service there on numerous occasions with visiting professorships at several law schools, including Yale, Cornell, UCLA, University of Connecticut, and Georgetown Law Schools. He has also served as a visiting professor in political science departments at Johns Hopkins University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he also has served as a visiting professor in the social studies program at Harvard University. Dr. Serrett lists 53 books that he has authored and or edited or co-authored, including titles such as Law and the Screen, Dissent and Dangerous Times, Law, Violence, and the Possibility of Justice, The Social Organization of Law, and one of my favorite titles, Law's Madness. He also notes that his Vita only includes a partial list of his articles in scholarly uh, journal publications, and he lists 159 of those articles in publications in journals such as Law and Society Review, the Wisconsin Law Review, the American Journal of Political Science, Law and Policy Quarterly, and the Yale Law Journal. His Vita includes 25 different awards 
and fellowships that he has received, again acknowledging that it is only a partial list, and he concludes that he has been a Woodrow Wilson Fellow, a visiting fellow at Oxford University, a Keck Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley, and in 1997, he was awarded the Harry Calvin Prize by the Law and Society Association, given in recognition of a distinguished body of scholarly work that has contributed most effectively to the advancement of research in law and society. Dr. Sarat is one of the country's leading experts engaged in the socio-legal jurisprudence examining the complex intersection between culture, law, politics, and public policy. Please join me in welcoming today's distinguished speaker, Dr. Austin Sarah. Thank you, thanks for a very kind and generous introduction. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here this morning. Uh, how many are here voluntarily? <laughs> okay, the rest of you, I, I try to make this as painless as possible. Uh, again, I want to thank Dennis for his uh, introduction, and as he read through my list of titles of books, uh, I think it's apparent to you that titles of books are not my strong point. With books titled The Social Organization of Law, that's the kind of book that doesn't appear very much on the Oprah Winfrey show. Turn your mic off, apparently. It's muted, maybe? Technology always reigns supreme here. Is that right, huh? You mean I've got to repeat all of that? <laughs> In any case, as Dennis went through my list of publications, I dreaded that he might come to a book titled Divorce Lawyers and Their Clients, uh, which I recommend, by the way, for your holiday giving. Um, this is a book, the title of which was so off-putting that one of my colleagues on hearing the, uh, the publication of this book opined that my next book would likely be called Homeowners and Their Mortgages. <laughs> um, I've resisted that, though been tempted several times. Today what I want to talk about is a subject are perhaps as painful as divorce lawyers and their clients. Namely, I'm interested in uh, the processes of clemency, about which I'll talk in a minute, in capital cases in the United States. I want to think out loud with you about what we can learn about the nature of law and our society's commitment to the rule of law by thinking about the processes by which governors in the United States decide when and whom uh, they will exercise this power to save. Uh, and let me start with two quotations, one from Thomas Paine and the other from Immanuel Kant. Thomas Paine famously has said, in America, the law is king. Keep that in mind. Immanuel Kant, reflecting on the power to grant pardons and reprieves, said, the right to pardon a criminal whether by mitigating or entirely remitting the punishment, is certainly one of the most slippery of all of the rights of sovereignty. And my talk this morning, I want to put into an imagined conversation Thomas Paine and Immanuel Kant. Let me tell you what I hope to accomplish uh, in our time together. And for those of you who are here compelled to produce uh, an account of what I'm about to say, let me give you an account. First, I turn to clemency, the power of governors in the United States and chief executives to mitigate or to pardon persons who have been convicted of criminal offenses. I turn to clemency as a site to examine the limits of law, and in particular, as a place to examine how law fashions its own limits. Clemency, the power of governors and chief executives to remit or to pardon, is a form of what I call lawful lawlessness. Lawful lawlessness. That is, clemency is a power which is legally authorized, but not legally regulated. So for example, the Constitution of the United States accords the President of the United States the exclusive right to grant 
pardons and reprieves. If the President of the United States were to abuse that power, to abuse that power, to grant a pardon for corrupt reasons, the fact of the reasons would not invalidate the pardon. And for example, in the state of Tennessee, some three decades ago, the governor of Tennessee was accused of taking bribes in return for granting pardons. He was subsequently convicted of corruption, but his pardons were upheld. Clemency is then a site to try to understand the limits of law. This legally authorized but not legal, legally regulated power poses a challenge, I will claim, to America's alleged commitment to the rule of law. My second purpose is to focus on clemency in capital cases because I believe that clemency in capital cases provides a window onto our culture's contemporary debate about capital punishment. And as many of you know, the United States is today engaged in a period of national reconsideration of capital punishment. Now, what I'm about to say speaks to the country at large. How it applies to Texas, you'll have to tell me. If you go back five or six years ago in the United States, 300 people across the country were sentenced to death. 300 people were sentenced to death. Last year, the number of people across the country sentenced to death was about 120. That is, the rate of death sentences in the United States has been cut more than in half. And again, if you go back five or six years ago and examine the number of people executed at the high point since the reinstituting re capital punishment in the United States in 1976, 98 people were executed. And that was about five or six years ago. Last year, 52 people were executed in the United States. These figures suggest that something is happening across the country in the United States. That people are beginning to think again about the utility of capital punishment and its place in our criminal justice system. I think that talking about clemency is one place to go to understand what is happening in this period of national reconsideration. Third, in my talk, I want to treat clemency as a rhetorical event. I want to look at what it is that governors say when they grant or when they deny clemency. And to treat these gubernatorial statements as symptomatic of a kind of anxiety associated with these instances of lawful lawlessness. Why is it that clemency, the power of governors to grant pardons and reprieves without effective legal review generates anxiety? It generates anxiety because it is a legally authorized but not legally regulated power. And as you're going to hear me say in a little bit, courts in the United States have said that governors may grant clemency for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. <laughs> Thank you. They were primed to do that, by the way. <laughs> governors can grant, grant clemency for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. You missed your cue. <laughs> Now imagine this idea of granting clemency enough already for a good reason or a bad reason or no reason at all. That's what some of my students think explains my grading policy for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. This idea that governors can grant clemency for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all, I'm arguing is anomalous, out of place, dissonant with our society's commitment to the rule of law to the idea that all exercises of power should be subject to rules and to accountability. So in turning to clemency, what I want to do is I want to examine what it is that governors say to try to alleviate the anxiety, the uncertainty, the nervousness that is associated with this instance of lawful lawlessness. 
power which is subject to no standard of legal review. And lastly, if pushed, I want to defend lawful lawlessness. I want to defend this legally authorized but not legally regulated power as important in encouraging the development of what I would call democratic maturity or democratic worldliness. Those are my purposes. That is the plan. I want to talk about three instances, three governors, three cases, in which the issue of clemency in a capital case was central to our national consideration of capital punishment. Let me start with California. December 13, 2005, Stanley Tukey Williams was executed by the state of California for the 1979 murders of four persons. Tukey Williams was infamous for his role in founding the Los Angeles Crips gang. While in prison, he refused to assist police in their gang investigations, but he renounced his gang affiliation and apologized for the Crips' founding while maintaining his innocence of the crimes for which he was convicted. Tukey Williams had become an anti-gang activist while in prison. He co-wrote children's books. He participated in efforts intended to prevent youths from joining gangs. For those efforts, he was nominated for both a Nobel Peace Prize and the Nobel Prize in Literature. The case of Stanley Tukey Williams set off an intense campaign to persuade the governor of California to spare his life, to grant clemency, with celebrities, activists, and anti-death penalty advocates saying he had shown himself to be, quote unquote, redeemed and rehabilitated, and that his anti-gang message from behind bars meant that his life was worth saving. The campaign to save Tukey Williams' life failed to convince Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to exercise his clemency power. At the time that Schwarzenegger denied Williams' petition for clemency, Schwarzenegger said of clemency decisions that they are always difficult, and this one is no exception. Such a statement is typical in the genre of gubernatorial clemency decisions, where often the governor portrays herself or himself as burdened by a godlike power and an agonizing decision. Yet, there was nothing in the way in which Schwarzenegger decided the Tukey Williams case or in his explanation for his decision that indicated that he had any difficulty or doubt about letting Tukey Williams uh, die, about letting his execution go forward. It's interesting to me as a social and political fact that clemency is what I call a rhetorical event, that when governors make clemency decisions in capital cases, they often feel compelled to produce long, elaborate explanations whether they grant or whether they deny clemency. And in the course of my research, I've read just about every statement made by a governor in a clemency case, in a capital case, in the last 100 years. Uh, it's a genre that I do not recommend to you unless you have trouble sleeping. Uh, these statements should come with a warning, do not read while operating power tools. Uh, some governors, in fact, have felt so compelled to explain themselves that they've written books on this subject uh, with such alluring titles as public duty, private agony. Uh, titles like that make me feel much better about divorce lawyers and their clients. When Schwarzenegger denied clemency to Tukey Williams, he claimed that Tukey Williams had made two incompatible arguments. First, that his life should be spared because he was not guilty of the crimes for which he had been executed. And second, Williams had said he deserves clemency because he has undergone a personal transformation and is redeemed. As Schwarzenegger put it, it's impossible to separate Williams' claim of innocence from his claim of redemption. Stanley Williams insists he is innocent and that he will not and should not apologize or otherwise atone for the murders of the four victims in this case. 
And what I'm about to tell you now is central to Schwarzenegger's thinking. Quote, without an apology and atonement for these senseless and brutal killings, there can be no redemption. In this case, the one thing that would be the clearest indication of complete remorse and full redemption is the one thing that Stanley Williams will not do, namely, apologize. Here we should note the theology that informed Schwarzenegger's explanation. Without atonement, there can be no redemption. For Schwarzenegger, clemency is about securing submission of those who seek pardon or commutation. And Williams would not submit. At the time of Stanley Williams' execution, many commentators drew parallels between his case and the celebrated Texas case of Carla Faye Tucker. In 1984, Carla Faye Tucker was convicted of the brutal murders of her ex-lover and his companion. During her trial, Tucker admitted that she and her boyfriend at the time took a pickaxe and hacked, hacked her former boyfriend and his companion to death while they were sleeping. During her long stay on Texas's death row, Carla Faye Tucker had what many believed to be an authentic religious conversion. In various pleas to save her life, Tucker's supporters claim that the Tucker of 1998, the year of her impending execution, was not the same woman who had committed those brutal murders 14 years earlier. Because of her conversion to Christianity, her apparent rehabilitation, and a virtual spotless disciplinary record while in prison, her supporters believe that Tucker's life should be spared. In the Tucker case, as in the Williams case, the line between the sacred and the secular was blurred, as it often is when death is on the horizon. Theological claims were advanced as the basis for an act of sovereign prerogative. These claims remind us that the specter of the sacred always haunts the law, even in the most resolute of contemporary secular democracies. The idea of the sacred is attached to places or entities that are by virtue of their sacred character set apart. The Latin root of the sacred has a double meaning. It signifies both something holy and also something accursed and devoted to destruction. And while current parlance often empties the term sacred of its darker connotation, recognizing the awesome and sublime aspect of that which is sacred provokes questions about the kinds of power law accrues when it is imagined of partaking of what the legal scholar Peter Fitzpatrick has called matters beyond the extant world like powers associated with clemency in capital cases. The sacred, whether it be made manifest in group ritual or an individual encounter, is powerful precisely because it conjoins what we desire with what we fear. The sacred conjoins what we desire with what we fear. This conjunction of desire and fear was present, in, was present in George Bush's explanation of his decision to deny clemency in the Tucker case. Unlike Schwarzenegger, then Governor Bush did not claim that he faced a difficult decision. He gave a brief, and I would say typically breezy rejoinder to clemency, Tucker's clemency petition. Let me read it to you in its entirety. This is what Governor Bush said at the time that he denied Tucker's clemency petition. Quote, when I was sworn in as governor of Texas, I took an oath of office to uphold the laws of our state, including the death penalty. My responsibility is to ensure our laws are enforced fairly and evenly without preference or special treatment. Many people have contacted my office about this execution. I respect the strong convictions which have prompted some to call for mercy and others to emphasize accountability and consequence. Like many touched by this case, Governor Bush, went, Governor Bush went on. I've sought guidance through prayer. Notice the invocation of the sacred. 
I've concluded judgment. I've concluded that judgment about the heart and soul of an individual on death row is best left to a higher authority. Carla Faye Tucker has acknowledged that she is guilty of a horrible crime. She was convicted and sentenced to death by a jury of her peers. The role of the state is to ensure, is to enforce our laws and to make sure all individuals are treated fairly under those laws. The state must make sure each individual sentenced to death has the opportunity for access to the courts and to a thorough legal review. The courts, including the United States Supreme Court, Governor Bush went on, have reviewed the legal issues in this case, and therefore I will not grant a 30-day stay. May God bless Carla Faye Tucker, and may God bless her victims and their families. Here, the demand for submission had been met. Carla Faye Tucker had acknowledged her guilt and apologized. But clemency was denied as Governor Bush shifted the register from matters of theology, right? He said he couldn't judge what was in someone's soul to matters of law. So unlike Schwarzenegger, who focused on the question of apology, repentance, and remorse, Governor Bush said the only thing that was in play for him in his exercise of the clemency power was the question of whether there had been adequate legal review. Not going to talk about what's in someone's soul, just going to look to see whether or not a person on death row had had a full and adequate legal process. Here, the desire for divine authority sits side by side with fear of the monstrous criminal other. Unlike Schwarzenegger, Bush called on divine authority to forsake making a judgment about redemption. And once redemption was put aside, Bush's only role was to ensure that the law was upheld and that everyone was treated fairly. Today, Governor Bush's legalistic view of clemency has become very much the norm in capital cases. It help, helps explain the virtual disappearance of grants of clemency in capital cases in the United States and the narrowing of the grounds on which clemency is today granted. And I put up on the board some figures to give you a sense of what's happened to clemency in capital cases. Between 1900 and 1929, more than 2,000 people were executed in the United States. That same period, 240 people were granted clemencies in capital cases across the United States. So about 12% of the cases resulted in a clemency. In the period 1930 to 1975, more than 3,700 people were executed in the United States. 838 cases clemency was granted for a rate of about 22%. Between 1976 and 2004, excluding the state of Illinois, about which I'm going to talk in a few more minutes, uh, there were 930 some odd executions in the United States, 54 clemencies, so about 5%. Today, it is virtually impossible to secure a clemency in a capital case on grounds other than a doubt about actual innocence. There are some cases for example, the governor of Virginia recently granted a clemency in a capital case on the grounds of alleged mental retardation of the death row inmate. But the Bush, nor, the Bush idea that the only ground for granting clemency would be to spare the execution of an actually innocent person is today very much the norm. Traditionally, in addition to this idea of error correction, there were three other grounds for granting clemency. First, political reasons. And political here in the best sense of the word. When Gerald Ford granted a pardon to Richard Nixon, do we all remember what Ford said? Some of you are old enough to have heard it on television. What did he say? Do you remember what he said when Ford granted a pardon to Nixon? Oh, this is really, it's like being at home back in my own classrooms. You ask a question, describe this as the phenomenon of what an academic imagines death to be like, which is you lie in your coffin and you ask questions and no one answers them. Thank you. This is a deeply sympathetic thing you are doing. What, what did he say? Exactly, right? Gerald Ford said, our long national nightmare is over. He didn't say he forgave Nixon. 
He didn't say that Nixon deserved clemency. He said he was granting clemency for a political reason. When Jimmy Carter granted an amnesty to the Vietnam draft evaders, he didn't say he forgave them. He didn't say they deserved clemency. He said it was time to heal the wounds of Vietnam. So the first ground for granting clemency, the Bush ground, is uh, error correction. A second ground are political reasons. A third ground, equity. Sometimes people argue in capital cases that they should be granted a clemency, a commutation, because their collaborator, their co-conspirator, got a lesser sentence, right? Person did the shooting, rolls over, gives himself up, enters a plea, gets a life sentence, testifies against the co-conspirator who ends up with a death sentence. And some of those people make claims for clemency on grounds of equity. And the fourth and last, and traditionally the most important ground for granting clemency, and one which today is very much out of favor, is what might be called grace or mercy. Grace or mercy. I would like clemency not because of a political reason, not because of an error in my trial, not because someone else got a less severe sentence, but because I appeal to you to grant me mercy. Here I think the supporters of Stanley Tukey Williams got it wrong. What do I mean by that? They claim that Stanley Tukey Williams, quote, deserved mercy. I believe that mercy can never be deserved. Mercy can never be earned. Mercy comes through acts of grace. Justice can be deserved. Mercy cannot. But whether I'm right or wrong in my definition of mercy, governors today in capital cases are extremely reluctant to be seen as exercising mercy or granting grace in capital cases. In the remainder of my time, I want to take up the legalistic understanding of clemency uh, that Governor Bush articulated and focus not on Schwarzenegger or Bush, but on another recent example of capital clemency, this time not where it was denied, but where it was granted. Namely, I want to examine the clemency in Illinois granted by that state's former Governor George Ryan. Governor George Ryan granted a mass commutation, a mass clemency of his state's entire death row. Here, I want to think less about the relationship of clemency and theology and more about the relationship of clemency and law. Remember, my purpose is to use clemency to help us think about the limits of law. On January 11, 2003, Governor George Ryan of Illinois emptied that state's death row by exercising his clemency power under the state's constitution, first pardoning and then commuting 167 condemned inmate sentences in the broadest attack on the death penalty in the United States in decades. Ryan's act was the single sharpest blow to capital punishment since the United States Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional in 1972, with the result that approximately 600 death sentences across the nation were reduced to life imprisonment. In 1972, in the case Furman versus Georgia, 600 death sentences were uh, changed to life in prison. Ryan's act was also a dramatic reminder of the powers of chief executives at the state and federal level, level to grant clemency and in so doing to spare life. Ryan acted against a backdrop in which clemency in capital cases, as I have said, has come to be one of the most dramatic and least often used of sovereign prerogatives. As I noted earlier, when Texas Governor George Bush was the governor of this state, he said, quote, in every case, I'd ask only, is there any doubt about this individual's guilt or innocence? And have the courts had ample opportunity to review all the legal issues in this case? Not surprisingly, Governor Ryan's mass commutation sparked immediate and intense controversy. How many people are on death row in Texas? I'm sorry? 450? What would be the reaction of the citizens of the state of Texas if Governor Perry, this is our deep counterfactual, woke up tomorrow morning and commuted all the death sentences of 450 people to life imprisonment without parole? What would be the reaction of the state of Texas? 
Impeach him? Please, that's too gentle a response. This is Texas. If he unconstitutionally couldn't do it, let's imagine he could. What would be the reaction of the state of Texas? Right? We'd want to execute him. I'm sorry? Kill him. We don't need anybody on life. Just put him to death. Bring back the electric chair. It's been nice being with you. Uh, in Illinois, the reaction to Governor Ryan's uh, uh, action was almost as draconian as that. Not quite. Death penalty opponents generally praised Ryan's decision while relatives of Illinois murder victims responded with vehement criticism. But criticism was not confined to the victim's community. One state senator, William Hain, who had helped convict two of the people that Ryan freed from death row during his tenure as a state's attorney, called Ryan's clemency decision, quote, a great wrong and an extraordinary and breathtaking act of arrogance. Hain argued that Governor Ryan, quote, severed the bond of trust between those who hold great power on behalf of the people and the people themselves. And I'm particularly interested in his next accusation. Hain said that Ryan's act, quote, had irreparably injured the law itself. It is not in the, tr this must be the ultimate insult in Illinois. It is not in the tradition of Abraham Lincoln. It is not in the tradition of Abraham Lincoln, Hain said, who believed in a government of law, not of men. Hain was angered that Ryan had used his gubernatorial power to circumvent the state's legal system. Quote, even those who are opposed to the death penalty must stand shocked at the use of the raw power of the governor to cut down the law itself. As monarchical prerogative or executive action in a constitutional democracy, clemency appears, as Hain said, to be the raw exercise of power against the law itself. Or as other scholars have said, quote, the pardon outruns the law as much through its logic as its end. But perhaps I would claim this rendering of such a stark and complete antithesis of clemency and law misses something in both something which William Blackstone long ago recognized in the ruler's prerogative. Clemency, Blackstone said, was, quote, one of the great advantages of monarchy in general, that there is a magistrate who has in his power to extend mercy, holding a court of equity in his own breast to soften the rigor of the general law in such criminal cases as merit an exemption or an exception from punishment. Saying that clemency issues from a court of equity, Blackstone highlights its complex and unstable relationship to law, though the equity of which Blackstone spoke sprung from the body of the sovereign. The sovereign's right to intervene, like equity itself, depends on the law getting a chance to get the right result. Thus, clemency would be seen as derivative of the law, secondary, complementary, and equitable. This language, derivative, secondary, complementary, situates clemency not in opposition to the law, but as doing work necessary to law itself. By referring to clemency as an exception, William Blackstone anticipated the contemporary discussion of sovereignty by theorists such as Giorgio Agamben. For Agamben, like the German scholar Carl Schmitt, the sovereign is he who decides on the state of the exception. The exception is, as Agamben put it, a kind of exclusion. But Agamben said, what is excluded from the general rule is an individual case. What is excluded is not on account of being excluded absolutely without relation to the rule. Clemency, then, I would contend, emerges from rule, but always contains in itself something beyond the complete discipline of rules. As the Attorney General of the United States put it in a 1939 report, okay, who was the Attorney General in 1939? Look, you're all now thinking, I hope this guy goes back to Massachusetts. <laughs> I have no idea, by the way. You could have said anything and I would have been completely at your mercy. In any case, there was an Attorney General in 1939 Whoever it was, he said the following. Describing clemency, quote, emerging from a field of mere arbitrary caprice or semi-magic folklore, 
Pardon has become an institution. I love this phrase. Listen to this phrase. Pardon has become an institution which is part of and yet above the legal system. You see the difference with Senator Haynes? Senator Haynes says it's an insult to law. Part of and yet above the law. A rule breaker which serves to, serves to improve the law. This language captures, I would say, clemency's complex inside-outside relationship to law. Clemency, I say, is a form of lawful lawlessness. Lawful lawlessness. Many theorists have been fascinated by this complex relationship of law and lawfulness. Theorists like Agamben have been fascinated by the relationship between sovereignty and law and have seen in pardon so the so-called right of grace. This interest, this conception, this idea that pardon is both inside and outside the law is, however, not the insight of sophisticated theorists alone. Similar ideas can be found throughout the jurisprudence of clemency. Examining the treatment of clemency in courts in the United States suggests that law cannot quite contain the exception, nor can it renounce the effort to do so. The judicial corpus, these decisions on clemency, give clemency its due as an opening, a fissure in legal life, and seem to take some comfort that in granting clemency this status, the courts are asserting their continuing supremacy. Let me quote from some of these decisions. Let me give you two examples. In a 1977 decision, the Supreme Court of Florida said the following, and again, no need for applause. An executive may grant, an executive may grant a pardon for good reason or bad reason or for no reason at all, and whatever his reason, his act is final and irrevocable. The court went on. Even for the grossest abuse of this discretionary power, the law affords no remedy. The courts have no concern with the reason which actuated the executive. The Constitution clothes him with the power to grant pardons, and this power is beyond the control or even the legitimate criticism of the judiciary. What happened to the rule of law? Or as the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit explained in a 1997 decision, quote, the very nature of clemency is that it is grounded solely in the will of the dispenser. He need give no reasons for granting or denying it. The governor may agonize over every petition. He may glance at one or all such petitions and toss them away. He may direct his staff as to the means for considering them or do anything that he wants. Unchecked and uncheckable will lodged within our legal system either fulfills the rule of law's promise to establish a government of laws and not of persons, nor establishes modern administrative law's attitude to almost all other executive acts. Indeed, if clemency has any resonance at all with the remainder of our constitutional scheme, that resonance is to be found in the jurisprudence of emergency, which authorizes responses to grave threats to the nation. It is here I would insist on another context that shapes the reception of gubernatorial clemency decisions, throwing the political alignments of those who would, for example, approve of what Ryan did and yet remain suspicious of a large discretionary executive power into disarray. For Ryan's mass commutation may be a more domestic issue and to fit into familiar arguments about capital punishment, but there can be no doubt that the power springs from the same source that has recently allowed the chief executive of this country to assert his right to install military tribunals and to suspend the writ of habeas corpus for alleged en enemy combatants. This re resonance, this reminder of the affinity between clemency and, legal and legally authorized, but unchecked and unreviewable power helps explain in part the anxiety, uncertainty, and instability which surrounds gubernatorial acts of clemency. As I told you, when governors grant clemency, they feel compelled to speak. I want to give you a little taste of what Governor Ryan said, right? I gave you a taste of what Schwarzenegger said and what Bush said when they denied clemency. Let me give you a little taste of what Governor Ryan said when he granted a mass clemency in Illinois. 
When Governor Ryan issued his mass commutation of death sentences, his decision, I would claim, spoke to and through the anxiety which surrounds exercises of the power of clemency. Attending to his 22-page hour-long speech, which was titled, I Must Act, suggests that Ryan spoke to try to fill in, to try to explain, to try to give an account of his act, to try to reassure his listeners that while his power was a form of lawful lawlessness, it was a power that they too would have exercised had they been his, in his place. Ryan's speech contains what I would claim are two somewhat contradictory stories. One is a story of victims and their suffering, the other of institutions and their failures. In both, Ryan put himself at the center, portraying himself as a victim of the very act he was about to perform. He tried to authenticate his act by identifying himself as a suffering su subject, able in his suffering to know the pain that families of murder victims suffer at the hands of criminals and that they would suffer at his hands. So Ryan is about to commute or to pardon everybody on the state's death row. What does he say in explaining his decisions? What does he say in explaining his decisions? And you'll note, as I give you a little taste of this, that nowhere in Ryan's explanation is there a hint of mercy or compassion for those who are the recipients of his act of grace. Nowhere is there a hint of mercy or compassion for those whose sentences he was about to commute. He painted himself as a reluctant victim of a political system in paralysis, with the governor reluctantly forced to act, hence the title of his talk, I Must Act. In the story of victims and their suffering, he displayed, I would contend, the fragile sovereignty uh, associated with constitutional democracy. He desperately sought to ground his act in a shared conception of citizenship, in which what binds us together is our shared suffering and empathy for victims. In the story of institutional failure, he embraced the fail-safe attitude towards clemency advocated by George Bush and later by former Supreme Court Justice William Rehnquist. He portrayed himself as someone committed to a tough on crime attitude who'd been driven to grant clemency by the failures of the judicial system. That Ryan's mass commutation is situated in the saga of an increasingly victim-centered political and legal environment is suggested by the great prominence that the language of victimization had in its speech. Listen to his words. I have read, Ryan said, listen to and discuss this issue with the families of victims as well as the families of the condemned. I grew up in Kankakee, which even today is a small Midwestern town. By the way, there'll be a prize for anybody who can spell Kankakee. I grew up in Kankakee. Kankakee, which, today is even, which even today is a small Midwestern town, a place where people tend to know each other. Now listen to what Ryan next says. He's explaining why he granted clemency. Steve Small was a neighbor of mine. I watched him grow up. He would babysit my young children, which was not for the faint of heart, since Laura Lynn, that's Ryan's wife, Laura Lynn and I had six children, five of them under the age of three. Do the math on that, by the way. He was a bright young man who'd helped run the family business. He got married. He and his wife had three children of their own. Laura Lynn was especially close to him and his family. We took comfort in knowing he was there for us and we for him. This is George Ryan explaining his clemency. One September midnight, he, Steve Small, received a call at his home. There'd been a break-in at a nearby house that Steve Small was renovating. But as he left his house, he was seized at gunpoint by kidnappers. His captors buried him alive in a shallow hole. He suffocated to death before police could find him. His killer led investigators to where Steve's body was buried. The killer, Danny Edwards, was also from my hometown. He now sits on death row. I also know his family. I share this story with you so that you know I do not come to this as a neophyte without having experienced a small bit of the bitter pill the survivors of murder must swallow. This is a ghostly as well as ghastly account, bringing before its listeners the specter of a dead man mercilessly slaughtered. But there's another specter in this story, this one of a life marked for its own untimely execution. 
By connecting himself to Danny Edwards, the murderer of Steve Small, Ryans invokes a kind of dual accountability. He's accountable both to the victim of the murder, Steve Small, but also to the person whose life is now in his hands. In this story, he's caught, almost literally torn, between the victim and the offender. And how does he authenticate or legitimate his decision? He reassures his listeners that he's tasted murder's bitter pill. This, I would contend, is hardly the language of a majestic distant sovereign. It, isn't ki it is a kind of domesticated sovereignty in which the sovereign is himself a kind of victim. For it is only by assuming the status of a victim of Danny Edwards' crime that he could claim a right to mitigate its punishment. As a victim and someone in contact with the experience of victimization, Ryan constituted his listeners as particular kinds of political subjects, earning their attention, as it were, through his own earnest attention to the claims of victims. As I came closer to my decision, Ryan said, I knew I was going to have to face the question of whether I believe so completely in this choice that I would make it even if it meant I had to face the prospect of commuting the death sentence of Danny Edwards, the man who committed the murder of a close friend of mine. I discussed it with my wife, Laura Lynn, who stood by me all these years. She was angry and disappointed at my decision, like many of the families of other, of, uh, the families of other victims will be. Here again, it is domesticity and domestic loyalties that frame an exercise of sovereign prerogative. This language, by the way, is so familiar to us now, I think that we barely note it, in which politicians associate the political realm with the domestic realm. But understood in a different way, what Ryan is telling us is familiar to us as soap opera. This is a domestic melodrama. He has to make a public decision. His wife will be upset. Why is that of public relevance to us, to know that his wife will be upset? Yet Ryan's desire to be responsive to victims was overridden in his I must act statement by a commitment to ensuring that offenders get what they deserve. Retribution provides a disciplining presence in his exercise of clemency, an anchor of lawfulness amidst his unchecked power. Quote, the facts I've seen in reviewing each and every one of these cases raise questions not only about the innocence of people on death row, but also about the fairness of the death penalty system as a whole. If the system was making so many errors in determining whether someone was guilty in the first place, how fairly and accurately was it in determining which guilty defendants deserve to live and which deserve to die? And Ryan famously cited the following numbers. He said from 1976 to 2001, 12 people had been executed in the state of Illinois. During that same period, 13 people had been exonerated and found actually innocent and taken off that state's death row. 12 executions and 13 exonerations. And Ryan said, with a 50-50 record of getting it right, the death penalty system in the state of Illinois was broken. So Ryan stopped the executions in the state of Illinois, largely because he believed that the death penalty system in Illinois was incapable of accurately distinguishing the guilty from the innocent and incapable of adequately deciding who among the guilty deserved the death penalty. Instead of a system finely grained to assigning punishment on the basis of a careful assessment of the nature of the crime, and the blameworthiness of the offender, Ryan found arbitrariness deeply enfolded in the operation of his state's death penalty system. In a system marked by such arbitrariness, perhaps only a clemency power committed to retributive principles, to making sure that no one was unjustly convicted and no one was unjustly executed, could provide a route to justice. Ryan turned to retributive calculus of desert in another context to justify his commutation not surprisingly, bringing Steve Small and Danny Edwards back to the story. Listen to Ryan. Some inmates on death row don't want a sentence of life without parole. They would prefer to be executed than to spend their life in prison. Danny Edwards wrote me and told me not to do him any favors, 
because he didn't want to face a prospect of life in prison without parole. They will be confined in a cell that is about 5 by 12. These are the people that he's commuting. They will be confined in a cell that is about 5 feet by 12 feet, usually double bunked. Our prisons have no air conditioning, except our supermax facility, where inmates are kept in their cell 23 hours a day. He's explaining why he's commuting death sentences. In the summer months, temperatures in the non-air conditioned facilities exceed 100 degrees. It's a stark and dreary existence. They can think about their crimes. Life without parole has even at times been described by prosecutors as a fate worse than death. This is a form of abolitionism or a form of opposition to the death penalty, which I call Bill O'Reilly abolitionism. Do you all listen to O'Reilly? You don't listen to O'Reilly? You shrug your shoulders. You've never seen O'Reilly? You have no desire to see O'Reilly. Do you know who O'Reilly is? Do you care about Bill O'Reilly? Bill O'Reilly is one of the most celebrated commentators on cable television in the United States. And he presides over an empire of things, one of which is a program called The O'Reilly Factor. Have none of you seen it? The problem of students at Sam Houston State is you do not watch enough television. <laughs> Get away from the books. Turn on the boob tube. Get a life. Well, if you've watched television and seen O'Reilly, Riley says he's opposed to capital punishment for two reasons. One, it's not severe enough. Right? Listen to George Ryan. Why am I granting Danny Edwards a commutation? So he can suffer more. And the other reason that O'Reilly's opposed to capital punishment is he suspects the government can't get anything right. So he's wor he worries about error. For someone like Bill O'Reilly, the delivery of the US mail is a form of unwanted government interference. So conservative is he. So Ryan associated himself not with what I would call a radical fringe, sympathetic to the plight of people on death row. No mercy or compassion. He explained he was granting commutation. He was moving people from death row to life imprisonment so that they could suffer more. Ryan told his listeners of Edwards' preference not to be spared in order to assure him, in order to ensure his listeners that his commutation decision actually satisfies the requirement of retributive justice better than capital punishment. Yet Ryan's discussion of Edwards' view on life without parole suggests that retributivism cannot ensure that there is a certain judgment about what it is that offenders deserve. Whether life without parole is worse than death for the crime of murder cannot be subject to a calculus which, grinds, which grounds the decision as to what sentence to give in a certitude beyond contest and alleviates the need to take responsibility for our punishment decisions. The last element of Ryan's speech was, in fact, to emphasize the responsibility and the power that his position accorded him. Quote, my responsibilities and obligations are more than to my neighbors and family, though you wouldn't think so from the, references, the, the number of times he referenced his neighbors and his family. I represent all the people of Illinois, like it or not. Isn't that a great statement? I represent all the people of Illinois, like it or not. The people of our state have vested in me the power to act in the interest of justice. Notice nothing about mercy, nothing about compassion. Even if the exercise of power becomes my burden, right, this is governor as suffering su subject. This is the governor as completely involved in a kind of narcissistic preoccupation with how difficult this decision is for him. Even if this exercise of power becomes my burden, I will bear it. I know that my decision will be just that. It will be my decision. Saying that he never intended to be an activist on the death penalty, George Ryan again portrayed himself as a victim, propelled against his own inclination to do a painful and costly duty that others refused to do. Talking about the legislature of his state, he said, we are a rudderless ship because they failed to act. Seizing that rudder is today, as it has long been, one of the imperatives of executive leadership in times of crisis. 
saying, quote, the legislature couldn't reform it, lawmakers wouldn't repeal it, but I will not stand for it, I must act. Ryan plunged himself into the lawful lawlessness that today, as it is always, marks the exercise of sovereign prerogative. George Ryan's commutation was, I have argued, symptomatic of the state of clemency in constitutional democracy. Despite its unusual sweep and the controversy which it generated, Ryan's clemency was well within the bounds of contemporary understandings of the clemency power. Far from disrupting the essential rhythms of American politics in its emphasis on suffering and victimization, it spoke to the victims' rights movement. In its, invase, in its embrace of retributive principles, Ryan appeared to be a tough on crime politician. And in its demonstration of energy in the executive, it gave new voice to ongoing trends in our political and cultural lives. Unlike Schwarzenegger in the Williams case, Ryan claimed no authority to judge who among those on his state's death row had or had not been redeemed. Like George Bush, he operated almost exclusively on the terrain of legality. Nonetheless, what he did made many uncomfortable. It again exposed a lawful lawlessness that is endemic to sovereign prerogative. Despite Ryan's effort to ground his acts in the suffering of victims, the systemic flaws of the capital punish punishment system, or the failures of a state's political institutions, he could not resolve the contradictory elements which both register our need for and discomfort with prerogative power. Our need for, as well as our discomfort for prerogative power. What I'm arguing is we need lawful lawlessness, even though we're uncomfortable with it. Senator Hain may have been right to characterize what Ryan did as, quote, a great wrong and an extraordinary and breathtaking act of arrogance, and to say that it broke the bond of trust between the people and the governor. But he was surely wrong when he alleged that it rendered the law meaningless. And if Ryan's pardon was an injury to law itself, it is an injury that the law authorizes and requires, a form of lawful lawlessness without which the law would indeed be rendered meaningless. As Abraham Lincoln himself vividly demonstrated, the survival of constitutional democracy may require just the kind of slipperiness and arrogance that sovereign prerogative displays and that Governor Ryan seemed to show. Learning to live with this slipperiness and this arrogance and recognizing the limits of law, the essentially ungovernable quality of sovereign prerogative even in a constitutional democracy is, I think, important as a step on the road to what I call democratic maturity, democratic worldliness. We need to recognize that law has its limits. We need to recognize that the solution to every political problem is not another legal rule. Only through acts of democratic engagement, only through acts in which we accept responsibility for those who exercise power on our behalf, can, I believe, are the citizens of the United States mature as a democratic body. The imperative then is to choose wisely those who are entrusted with the power to spare life or to let it be extinguished for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. Thank you and now I would love to hear questions and argument and your thoughts. Great question. That's a terrific question. Um, Ryan, the, and this is, it's a great question because on the rare occasions in which governors grant clemency in capital cases, they generally, though not always, do it as they're leaving office. Ryan did it with two days left in his term. And not only would Ryan not reelected, in fact, he wouldn't have been reelected. He was subsequently indicted and tried and sentenced for corruption when he was the state's uh, secretary of state. But it is characteristic that governors, when they grant clemency, especially these kind of mass commutations and capital cases, do it on their way out of office. It is worth noting, though, that he has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize for his actions as governor in granting clemency. And some of us fantasize that he'll receive his prize in Joliet. Right? He'll, he'll ask for a, you know, a, a weekend release to go to Sweden. <laughs> yeah. In your breakdown of the three periods there, uh, did you notice uh, a difference in the reasonings that the uh, state managers gave for the commutations? Yeah, again, that's a great question. 
between 76 and 2004, I'm arguing about the only grounds, not the only grounds, but about the only grounds is, are these doubts about uh, legal error. In earlier periods, there were equity claims, there were claims of, uh, claims of mercy, and as I said, there were these political arguments. But really, since 1976, uh, these, these, these arguments about legal error are about the only ground. And I think that's true for two reasons. One, I think, is more straightforward and more intuitive than the other. Uh, you could argue that governors are reluctant to grant clemency in capital cases because there's no political gain in doing so. You infuriate the victim's community, you typically infuriate the law enforcement community, you alienate uh, uh, parts of your uh, constituency, and who's happy? Uh, you know, Amnesty International chapter in your state, the families, a family of the condemned. That's the more obvious reason. I think there's a second reason why clemency may have declined and why about the only focus now is on uh, legal error. And that has to do with the post-1976 jurisprudence of capital punishment. Since 1976, the jurisprudence of capital punishment has basically said that juries may refuse to impose death sentences for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. That we have bifurcated trials, we have aggravated mitigating factors. Juries are, in essence, asked to decide on the question of mercy in the penalty phase of every capital trial. So governors today can say they want to second guess the judgment about whether this person, and again, I'm going to use what I think is absolutely the wrong phrase, deserve mercy, because I think no one deserves mercy. Uh, but governors can say that judgment's already been made been made by the, uh, by, the, by the jury. But in the most recent period, and, and by the way, I want to say the following, uh, though I didn't say it in my talk. I think George Ryan did the right thing for all the wrong reasons. I think he did the right thing for all the wrong reasons. And what I've tried to argue is that this conception of the clemency power as only error correction bureaucratizes, juridifies, and narrows clemency. It makes clemency into just the next step on the Judicial Court of Appeals. Whereas clemency was never intended to be that. Clemency was intended to be a power available to be used by chief executives for political reasons, for reasons of grace or mercy, for reasons of equity, not just for reasons of law. Awesome. To throw a, a question, and I genuinely am curious about your sense on this. Texas has, as Raymond pointed out, constrains significantly the right. power of the governor to exercise clemency right. or pardon, but still can. The only person removed from death row by Governor Bush yes. was Henry Lee Lucas, and yeah. he was removed because of factual innocence right. for the crime for which he was convicted. Now, he allegedly was involved, he was this infamous serial yeah. murderer, and right. whether or not he did all of those things. But his sentence was commuted from death to life for having been found innocent of the crime for which he was convicted. How do we reconcile that? He didn't get released from prison. He was taken off of death row and put into prison where he ultimately dies as a result of illnesses. But the condition of his innocence, and I don't know what Bush said at the time of, the, of his commutation, but he was commuted because the facts of the case for which he was convicted established he could not have committed that crime. Yeah, one, one way to reconcile it, and again, I don't know the particular facts of that case, one way to reconcile it is to acknowledge the difference, and governors sometimes do acknowledge this difference, between uh, so-called legal innocence and factual innocence. Right? A governor can say the evidence here suggests um, that there, should, there is legal doubt, but leaves open the question about whether or not he did it, because the standard in law is not whether you did it, but whether it, whether it can be, whether it can be uh, proven. And of course, it's much easier though it is difficult, it's much easier to commute a death sentence than to grant a, grant a, full, uh, a full pardon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, how, uh, it, it seems sort of tenuous to ascribe to an elected official yeah. the, uh, say that this is their real reason because that's their stated reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fabulous. But I'm not interested in real reasons. Oh, no, I didn't say that for funny. Okay. I said I'm interested in the rhetoric of clemency. I'm not interested in the reasons for clemency. 
Um, I have no idea why Ryan granted clemency. Maybe he did it to upset his wife. I mean, she's vividly present in this statement. Maybe he did it because uh, it would you know, get him sympathy as he was about to be indicted. Maybe he did it because uh, he wanted to win the Nobel Prize. Maybe he did it because he authentically believed that capital punishment was immoral. Maybe he did it. I'm not interested in that. I'm not saying one shouldn't be interested in that. I'm interested in the rhetoric. Why am I interested in the rhetoric? Because I'm interested in the way in which when governors talk about clemency, they speak to this anxiety associated with lawful lawlessness. I mean, the point in this argument is to say less about clemency and more about the rule of law. Right? It's to argue that um, these instances of legally authorized but not legally regulated power are, are necessary. But they put, put us in the position where we have to confront the idea that law can't save us, that rules can't save us. That ultimately the question of whether or not someone's life will be spared is a decision, as the courts say, that rests in the will of a single, of a single individual. So I actually am interested in what George Ryan said uh, as a symptom of how it is that political figures respond to this anxiety associated with uh, lawful, uh, lawful lawlessness. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in the sense of what I would call the performative aspects of executive clemency. I'm interested in how it is that some governors like Schwarzenegger and Bush associate clemency with the sacred, with the theological. I'm interested in how other governors, like Ryan, associate clemency with the victim's community. As if what he wanted to do was he wanted to uh, legitimate his clemency by saying that he was a victim too. He tasted some small uh, bit of the bitter pill that murder victims uh, uh, taste. I'm interested in that he performs clemency without compassion, at least rhetorically. There's no Christian forgiveness here. There's Bill O'Reilly, tough on crime. I'm going to do something to them which is worse than giving them a death sentence. Uh, because I think that's a symptom of how it is that, in the contemporary political culture, political figures think that they can legitimate these, uh, these, these decisions. And again, there are other instances. If you go back to New Mexico in 1986, the governor of New Mexico, Tony Anaya, he commuted his state's death row, I think there were five or six on Mex uh, New Mexico's death row at that time, and made a, a straightforward anti-death penalty speech. He was going to take these people off death row because he was opposed to capital punishment, he was going to let anybody go to th their death, and he invoked Christian forgiveness. Governor Winthrop Rockefeller, when he was governor of Arkansas, also commuted his state's death row, again a small number, said more or less the same thing, that he was opposed to capital punishment. But those kind of philosophical or Christian compassion statements are no longer present, and that was part of my response to you. And I think we can understand why they're, um, uh, why, why they're not. I'm very afraid that that the governor's <laughs> No. At the end of their terms. At the end of the terms. So I recommend, if you're going to grant commutation, do it at the end of your terms, because it won't make you politically po popular. Yeah. Is the, uh, what are the historical origins of clemency? Where did it come from? And uh, right. chief executives around the world, do all chief executives around the world have clemency? And do they use the same kind of reasons that we see here in the right. United States? Well, I can easily answer the second question, and that is I don't know. <coughs> I don't know. I don't know about Chief Executive Brown. It's a great question. I don't know. Uh, I suspect that clemency, that the power to spare life, is associated with many political systems. John Locke famously said in the Second Treatise on Civil Government that sovereignty is the right to take and spare life. To take and spare. You know you're a sovereign if you can authorize the taking of life and if you can spare life. But I don't know the, the, um, I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, uh, the question about other places. As to its origins, you know, it depends on who you read. You can go back to the Romans and read Seneca. Seneca uh, recommended clemency to the Roman uh, leaders, and he described clemency as mildness. Right? Clemency is a form of mildness in punishment. You heard my reference to Blackstone, right? Associating clemency with monarchs and the monarchical prerogative to uh, spare life and, and grant mercy. And it's certainly, ideas of clemency are certainly associated with uh, the Judeo-Christian Judeo tradition. I mean, think about uh, 
Think about the Abraham and Isaac story. Right? God both condemns and pardons, if you will. God both sentences and says, stay thy, stay thy hand. So ideas of clemency are very old, associated with both religious traditions and as far back as I know of the Romans. Yeah, I think of this clemency idea that has also been uh, the form of death. Is that right? Say again? And the clemency idea, there's also been the form of death. In other words, the suffering that's associated with the execution, I can grant you clemency to just have you killed versus having you dismembered. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, um, it's yeah. something to think about in there. That's part of the clemency issue, you know, how you execute to it. Yeah, I think that's right. But I think the question of how you execute, that's exactly right. So this is not a but, this is an and. Um, I think the question of how you execute uh, really goes to other issues, right? You can imagine not sparing life, but if you will, mitigating the suffering by choosing a different form, uh, choosing a different form of death. I, I think there's an interesting paradox in the American attitude towards capital punishment, and that is uh, we want capital punishment because we want it to uh, express our moral condemnation of the criminal, our moral outrage at the crime, but yet we seek forms of the death penalty that are as substantially painless as possible, right? We seek forms of capital punishment that are as substantially painless as, as, uh, as, as, as possible. Uh, and some people think, and I'm one of them, that that's a, a deep contradiction, that we want it to express our condemnation, we want it to express our outrage, we want it to express our revulsion, but yet um, we seek these humane forms of, of death. And, some of my work I've been interested in uh, what I call law's violence. And the question of how law's violence is different from the violence to which it is opposed. How it is the death penalty is different from murder other than it's law's violence, right? That law does it. And here, very instructive is to read Justice Scalia's opinion in a case called Collins versus Collins, in which Scalia says, quote, how enviable a quiet death by lethal injection when compared to the crimes that um, that merit it. So yes, clemency or mildness can be associated with sparing people the most painful forms of death. But as I said, it, this issue of the form of execution, I think, speaks to much larger issues um, than that in terms of the legitimacy of capital punishment. This, yeah. Go ahead. I would just like to address to it, but tie into what we just discussed. If I understand correctly, the difficulties in legal judgment are illegal. Uh, capital offenders to death are illegal veterinary circles. Uh, if that is true, is this justice to put people to death? And that being said, do you see that being an issue before the Supreme Court in the country? If that has not been already, I'm yeah. honest. Well, right. Let me start with the second question and then hopefully forget the first one. And if I do forget the first one, you'll remind me of it, okay? I'm going to start with the second question. I'm going to hopefully forget the first one. Um, not because it's not a good question. It is a very good question, which I hope to avoid answering. Um, the, the set, which in law school, is law is called confession and avoidance. So I want to confess and avoid. It's a very good question. I want to try to avoid answering it. Um, the, the second question about what the Supreme Court will do, I have two diametrically opposed views. One, the Supreme Court has very rarely reviewed methods of execution, very rarely. It's spent a lot of time on procedures of deciding how we go about choosing those who die. When it has reviewed methods of execution, it has upheld them. So on one side, uh, you, one might think if these cases, cases out of California, cases out of Oklahoma, cases out of Florida ever get to the United States Supreme Court, if they accept them, they're likely to approve. The, the other side, though, and I'm not very good at predicting the United States Supreme Court, I'm going to come back to this period of national reconsideration of capital punishment. Um, I think the Supreme Court is doing, and I'm going to get myself into trouble, so I think the Supreme Court is doing with the death penalty what uh, anti-abortion activists have been doing with abortion. I think the Supreme Court is doing with the death penalty what anti-abortion activists um, are, have been doing with abortion. Uh, you know, wisdom suggests at this point I should just leave and let you contemplate that comparison. But let me see whether I can unpack it. Uh, Anti-abortion activists in the United States 
have done a masterful job of leaving Roe versus Wade in place while completely hollowing out the right to abortion. And they've done it in a variety of ways. They've made it very difficult to find abortion providers. So in many states in the United States, there's one or two people in the entire state who perform abortions. They've enacted uh, uh, parental notification laws. They've enacted uh, laws having to do with partial birth abortion. In other words, they're going at it piecemeal. And the United States Supreme Court, by the way, I think will never abolish capital punishment. But if you look at its decisions on the juvenile death penalty, and you look at on decisions on, on mental retardation, and you look at its complete and utter abuse of the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals in a whole variety of cases, it seems that what people on the United, some of the justices on the United States Supreme Court are doing are, are chipping away at it. In that context, maybe lethal injection would be another place to chip away. However, if they were to say lethal injection is unconstitutional, they wouldn't end the death penalty, right? They would return it to a situation, I think, of what's now done in Oklahoma, which is the use of one chemical and a lethal dose of an anesthetic, which is exactly what veterinarians do when they put down animals. Uh, and I wouldn't predict that they would, I mean, I wouldn't predict that Justice Roberts and Alito and Scalia and Thomas, the whole world, the fate of the world is in the hands of Justice Kennedy, uh, which is a thought somewhat chilling to contemplate. It's up to him. So uh, that's my view about what will happen in the Supreme, Supreme Court. On the larger question of the justness or unjustness of capital punishment and method, particular methods of execution, I, I'm interested in the analytic rather than normative uh, um, issue. I mean, I know I'm not going to hide the ball. Normatively, I'm an abolitionist. I think the United States should not have capital punishment, but not for the traditional reasons of you know, it's immoral or any of that reason. I think capital punishment is fundamentally incompatible with the spirit of democracy. I mean, what is democracy after all? Democracy is uh, the opportunity to change your mind. That's what we do. Every four years we have an opportunity to change, change our mind, right? The spirit of democracy is the spirit of reversibility. And the death penalty is not reversible. Uh, but I think that the issue of methods of execution don't go to the large questions. They go to how it is that we legitimate capital punishment. That's why I pointed to Scalia. We legitimate capital punishment by saying our violence is better than the violence to which it is opposed. We legitimate capital punishment by saying we don't punish cruelly. Um, and by the way, I think that's a substantial human achievement. I don't dismiss that. You know, I live in a small town in Western Massachusetts, so other than watching television, I don't have a lot to do. And one of the things I love to do is I love to contemplate the various amendments to the Constitution. My favorite amendment is the Eighth Amendment. I mean, not a lot of people have a favorite constitutional amendment. You can see I'm really big at par parties, right? Like, what's your favorite amendment to the Constitution? Uh, it doesn't make me very popular, but it is my life. And my favorite amendment to the Constitution is the Eighth Amendment because I think it, it, it captures the, in the most profound way the spirit of constitutionalism, which is the spirit of restraint. Right, unlike the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, the Sixth Amendment, which are rights of the accused, the Eighth Amendment commits us to treating people who are guilty uh, often better than they deserve. No cruel punishment. Cruel punishment may be exactly what one deserves on the basis of what one does. And I think that's what the technology of execution debate is about, whether or not we can live up to that, that commitment. Are you going to share your favorite amendment? Okay, what's your favorite amendment? The first. <laughs> the first? <laughs> the one not about speech. Well, that's part of it, but it has to do with, you know, speech, the right to assemble, the right to worship the white ladies, and so on and so forth. That's your favorite amendment. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> because you just presented a quandary here, that in our ethics class on tomorrow morning will be discussed probably at great length, um, which is, which, if, if you're eight, the Eighth Amendment is your favorite, favorite and you're uh, opposed to capital punishment on the grounds of democratic principles and the right to reverse decisions, yeah. which is crueler to, to execute somebody for the horrendous crimes that they may have committed, or to leave them locked as an animal in a cage for the rest of their natural life in the worst possible conditions you can imagine. Right. Well, let's think about what cruelty means.
Cruelty in the constitutional tradition does not mean the absence of suffering. Does not mean the absence of suffering. Cruelty means imposing no more suffering than is necessary. That's what cruelty, right? That's what the constitutional prohibition of cruel punishment means. It doesn't mean punishment which is not, uh, doesn't impose suffering, is cruel, right? It simply means you impose no more suffering than is necessary. What does that mean? That means in any conversation about punishment, the burden is on the state under the Eighth Amendment, or at least under my interpretation of the Eighth Amendment. Uh, the burden is on the state to show that it is the least suffering necessary. The least suffering necessary. So that's the formula I would use, right? Rather than make a particular judgment about life imprisonment without parole or particular judgment about any term of confinement. That the standard is the least, least suffering necessary. So if you could show me that life imprisonment without parole is necessary to the attainment of legitimate state ends, whatever they are, I might be convinced that life imprisonment without parole is not cruel. Now, my favorite amendment to the Constitution, the Eighth Amendment, is not the only thing I think about. So one could say that life imprisonment without parole is not constitutionally impermissible, that it is constitutionally permissible and still be opposed to it on policy grounds or on other grounds. So I love the Eighth Amendment, but it's not all I have to say. Yeah, do you, do you think clemency uh, manifests a ruling class? You know, That's a great order. question. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, sometimes it gives them too much power, especially prerogative power. Yeah. Like, why, why would we go into this war the way we did without Congress's approval? We haven't had Congress's approval since uh, World War II, you see. And that, those are prerogative powers that you're Yeah, absolutely. About. That's great. And, That's uh, totally fabulous. So uh, I was just giving an example. Yeah. A lot of people are disagreeing with the war now. Yeah, totally fabulous. And same with the Vietnam War. And a lot of people disagree with uh, capital punishment. Yeah. So do you think it causes a ruling class with big men governorship? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, that's great. That's totally fabulous. And you went, you went right to the Achilles heel of my talk uh, in a way which I find cruel. <laughs> um, so let me tell you why I think you're going right to the Achilles heel of my talk. You see, I, I make no friends with this particular position. The people, in, in my friends, the abolitionists, uh, despise me for criticizing Ryan, who is a hero in the abolitionist community. They particularly despise me for associating Ryan with Governor Bush. Right? They think that's cruel. Um, I make no friends among my liberal sympathizers because I'm defending prerogative power. Remember the paragraph in the middle, I said, you really want to understand the jurisprudence of capital punishment, you have to understand the jurisprudence of emergency. If you read Federalist 74, Federalist Papers number 74, you see that Alexander Hamilton uh, justifies granting the exclusive power to grant pardons and reprieves in the President of the United States by saying it'll be useful in times of national emergency, times of sedition or rebellion, right? He, he tied them together, times of sedition or rebellion, clemency, pardon, amnesty would be useful. Uh, okay, so what's my text in answering your question? Great question. My text, and I recommend this to you. You're going to read it if I recommend it? No. Let's try again. <laughs> Are you going to read it if I recommend it? You have to make it interesting. <laughs> what were we talking about? <laughs> well, then forget it. I'm not answering your question. <laughs> um, okay, if you read it, I'll give you extra credit. There you go. I'd like if you'd read it. And let me know what you think about it. That would be, that'd be an act of kindness. The text is an unusual one to bring into this, and that's just as Robert Jackson's dissenting opinion in the case of Korematsu versus the United States. Korematsu versus the United States decided in 1946 was a case in which the United States Supreme Court was asked to, uh, uh, to decide the constitutionality of the internment of Japanese Americans at the end of World War II, the mass internment of Japanese Americans on the basis of their race. Be, 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 you have read it. Totally fabulous. Yeah, then, <laughs> so you'll read it again. <laughs> you know, I'm going to tell you one very quick, very dull story. It is, it is dull, but it is quick. When I was in law school, I went to law school after I'd been teaching for 10 years. And I'd written many things about law. In my first law school class, which is a class called Civil Procedure with a professor named Jeffrey Hazard, he started the class by talking about how you frame a legal complaint. What's the difference between a legal form and a social form? And he used as the frame for his discussion an article called The Emergence and Transformation of Disputes, Naming, Blaming, and Claiming. I'm a first-year law student in his class. He's talking about an article 
an article called The Emergence of Transformation is Used Naming, Blaming, and Claiming. How do you move from social facts to legal facts? At the end of the class, I went up to Professor Hazard and I said, Professor Hazard, I really liked what you had to say about that article, The Emergence of Transformation is Used Naming, Blaming, and Claiming. And Hazard said, we ought to read it. I said, I wrote it. To which his response was, that's no excuse, you should read it anyway. <laughs> so that's what I thought of when you said, oh, but I've already read this. Okay, so you know what the case is, you know what the case is about. That story, I knew I, I knew I was giving it away as soon as I told you the title, right? Had it been written by Austin Sarek. Um, what does Jackson say in Korematsu? Justice Black upholds the internment. He says it's constitutional. Justice Murphy, said, in his dissent, says terrible. Constitution doesn't permit it. Justice Jackson says the Constitution has nothing to say about it. That there are certain powers which exist beyond constitutional measure. And that's what I'm saying about clemency, that it's a power that exists beyond constitutional measure. And that's what I say about the jurisprudence of emergency. You wouldn't want every detail of our emergency response to be subject to congressional deliberation. Maybe you would, but I wouldn't. So this I is what I, work I'm sorry? Work well, let's get another, have me back. We'll have that discussion, right? Okay. Um, but you, what you identified is exactly what I'm interested in, which is the places where uh, the democratic constitutional process runs out. There are other places, for example, the power of a prosecutor to decline prosecution. In most states and in most things, for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. The power of a jury in a capital case to refuse to impose the death penalty, typically not reviewable. Jurors can do it for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. And what you're pointing to is the power of the modern president to commit troops in the name of the United States for good reason or bad reason or maybe no reason at all, to which I say grow up, learn to live with it, don't wish for checks and balances, they'll get you out. Don't wish for the Supreme Court to intervene, it'll get you out. Um, by the way, I'm not embracing arbitrariness as the sole good thing in life. I'm simply saying that what you've identified in executive power in times of national emergency and I've identified in executive clemency is necessary to the cultivation of democratic maturity or democratic worldliness. It seems like people lose reason really fast and they use emotion to make decisions. Yeah, but, yeah, that's, that may very well be. In other words, the question of why it is that these powers are exercised or on what grounds they're exercised, right, that's the question about what the real reasons are is yet a whole nother, whole nother conversation. Terrific question, and I'll look for the email about what you think about Robert Jackson. Yeah. I have a comment on democracy since we're talking about democracy. That we're talking about democracy came from God, from King, from such and such and such. Uh, and Muslims are sure that they're not Muslim. The only clemency can come only from the family of the victim. Uh -huh. So it's not God, it's not the king, it's not anybody else. And until the perpetrator is put there on the streets and ready to get beheaded, if the father of the victim says, stop, I forgive, that's the only kind of clemency that can Yes, right. It's very interesting in a whole variety of ways to me. One is just to pick up on the last point, stop, I forgive. Um, and again, in the Western tradition, clemency need not be linked to forgiveness. Clemency need not be linked to forgiveness. When Richard Nixon granted a pardon to George, to, I mean, when Gerald Ford granted a pardon to Richard Nixon, he did not forgive him. So at least in the Western tradition, clemency is separate, is, is not necessarily linked to, to, to forgiveness. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, I'm very interested in the example because I would take it that this example of let's call it private clemency, or the power to grant the reprieve left to the family, would also be associated with for good reason or bad reason or no reason at all. Does the family have to provide a reason? Does the father have to give a reason? Uh, he doesn't have to give a reason, but in, you know, in his own mind or state of mind, he thinks that this is a way to get closer to God, and God will smile yeah. on him for yeah. forgiving yeah. somebody else. Yeah, that's totally right. So that's an emotional sense yeah. of his mind. Yeah, that's great. That's great. The other quick question is, uh, I was reading an article yesterday, perhaps the same article was mentioned today, uh, written by a colleague that somehow indicated the short-term impact of execution on the rate of homicides. 
Yeah. That if you have a homicide on Tuesday here for the next five days, the rate of homicides will go down. Would you make a comment on this? No. What's that? Yes. Um, uh, it, my reluctance to make a comment on it is it's just not something I have studied particularly. And what I uh, know about this debate is that some people argue just the opposite, that there's data to show that homicide rates go up after executions, that homicide stimulate, I mean, execution stimulates, right? It puts out their messages about, about violence. So the data that I've seen suggests uh, evidence on both sides. How can execution stimulate? I mean, it, 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 in what sense? Psychological, social? Easy. They exemplify the use of violence. They legitimate the use of violence. There's a wonderful article, if you're interested in this, by Robert Weisberg called, uh, I think, Legal Violence as Moral Example in a book called Law's Violence, edited by Austin Sarrett, uh, which, by the way, makes very good holiday giving, in which uh, Weisberg lays out this argument that what, what, what uh, state violence does is it exemplifies that the use of violence may be legitimate. And we model, the state models, right? David Garland, a sociologist at NYU, uh, uh, describes what he calls as this sort of modeling function of punishment. Punishment models. So uh, again, I want to disclaim any expertise here. It's not an area that I've studied in particular, but the data that I know uh, comes out, uh, you know, some people say, yes, yeah, short-term decline. Some people say uh, short-term st uh, stimulation. I also understand that Peter Manning is writing an article for you on the Nazi. Uh-oh, you know a lot about me. Yes, yes, he does. Thank you very, very much. Thanks for great questions.